Hi, I'm Ken Trember. Welcome to the KTA University podcast. The podcasts are designed to tackle subjects related to fabrication, construction, cleaning and painting, both commercial and industrial. Our topic today is related to measuring dry film thickness by two different techniques. One where you just take spot measurements and the other is where you use scanning probes. And my guests are Bill Corbett and John Todd. John, I understand you'll be talking about the traditional method of individual readings. That's correct. And Bill, you'll be using the uh, scanning probes. Yes. Uh, in terms of qualifications, Bill, you're active in ASTM D0123, mm -hmm. which develops a standard for D7091 uh, yes. for dry film thickness. And you're also the chair of the SSPC committee for SSPC yes. PA2. Mm -hmm. And John, you grew up uh, as a contractor using the gauges and now as uh, KTA's operations manager for inspection services. So you've got a lot of good hands-on field experience with the instruments. Absolutely. Uh, before we begin, I just want to mention to those who are listening to the podcast, uh, both John and Bill will be demonstrating the gauges to some extent. So while they'll be explaining it pretty well and you'll be able to understand by listening, it might help in the future to log on to the podcast to actually see what they are doing to get a better feel for how these instruments actually work. All right. Since our audience may not be familiar with you know, measuring coating thickness, John, can you describe mm -hmm. the, the first the use of the traditional uh, individual gauge reading type assessments? Yes, so, so yes, the Defelscope probe that I'm using, it, once it's uh, powered on, it's quite simple to use. Simply examine the probe, make sure the uh, probe is clean, there's nothing on there that may alter or affect the readings. Take the probe, press it uh, against the surface, make sure you hold it steady, and then once it flashes the reading, you can simply pick it up and move it to another reading, and you can just do this as quickly as I'm picking it up and putting it down. And Bill, what about the uh, scanning probe technology? Well, interestingly, uh, it's uh, a very similar device, except the, the probe is a little different. Uh, again, like John said, you'll want to examine to make sure it's clean. But in this case, if we can take a close look, you'll notice that the probes themselves are, are quite different. Uh, this one has a wear surface because as we scan across the surface, we'll be taking measurements by moving the probe rather than a point and remove. So we can set up the gauge uh, so in scanning uh, or continuous read mode and simply place the probe down on the surface and scan across the surface. And it will continue to take readings until the probe is picked up. So Bill, you, you have a DeFalco instrument also, it looks like, the same as the one John used. Uh, are there other manufacturers of scanning probe technology? Sure, there's at least three manufacturers. The DeFalco gauge is one manufacturer. Alcometer also has scanning probe technology. And uh, Fisher Technology uh, has a continuous readout device uh, that, that can be scanned across the surface as well. So at least three manufacturers have the technology. Okay, now I, I see you mentioned you showed specifically the probe having, I think you said a wear surface or something like that. Correct. Do they all have that type of technology? Uh, the technologies differ a little bit. With the uh, DeFelsco product, uh, they use a wear resistant probe. With the alcometer's uh, scanning probe, they actually have a disposable, they call it a wear cap, uh, and it's actually a, a nice little patented uh, process where the gauge can actually, it automatically deducts for the thickness of the, the cap on the probe, so it, it is not included in your coating thickness measurements, hmm. but it also hmm. will indicate when the probe cap needs to be replaced, the wear cap needs to be replaced, when it too is, is wearing to the point where it's no longer effective. Interesting. Uh, Bill, I know you're active in the uh, ASTM and SSPC committees. Can you discuss a little bit about the ASTM standard and the SSPC standard? Yeah, it's um, the, I'll start with ASTM. Uh, ASTM D7091 actually replaced two standards uh, that uh, were discontinued. One of the standards was for measuring coatings on ferrous metal surfaces, and then one of them was for non-ferrous metal surfaces. Um, about oh, 10 to 12 years ago, those two were discontinued and one standard was, was, uh, was uh, put together. 
and it focuses on coatings on ferrous and non-ferrous uh, non metal surfaces, and it's uh, D7091, as you mentioned earlier. It really focuses on four areas. It focuses on uh, gauge calibration, verification of accuracy, adjustment, and then how to take, physically take the measurements, how to use the gauges. It briefly addresses frequency, uh, and it's more for manufactured parts and pieces. You know, how many pieces to check uh, in a manufacturing process, that type of thing. Uh, when you have uh, an industrial structure, the ASTM standard points to an SSPC standard for frequency of measurement, which is SSPC paint application standard number two, or PA2. Uh, that standard points more or less to the ASTM standard for gauge use, although it addresses calibration, verification of accuracy, and adjustment as well. But the focus of PA2 is really on how many readings to take uh, in, a, in an area and how to determine whether or not those measurements conform to the specification. Uh, it also has a procedure for if you have a, a non-compliant area, how you identify the magnitude of that non-compliant area, whether it's widespread or very localized. Uh, and it also has a nice uh, coating thickness restriction level table in it. You know, level one is extremely restrictive on the tolerance of spot or area measurements, and then the uh, level five is the least restrictive. So a specifier can actually specify a level uh, that determines how far out of specification the spot measurements, area measurements, and gauge readings are allowed to be. Wow, sounds like a lot of information. I know the subject of this. <laughs> podcast is really the scanning versus the, uh, you know, single reading probes. Uh, but if someone wanted to read more about what you just said or learn more about both these standards, where might they find that information? Yeah, you can find a lot of articles and videos on, on KTA University. Uh, there's, there's also some hot podcasts on gauge use there. Also, SSPC has a, a nice, oh, three-quarter day course or so called Using PA2 Effectively. And uh, it's, it's a very good course on, uh, on how, to, uh, how to interpret PA2 and what it really means. Um, you know, you mentioned how much is involved in that document. I didn't even mention the fact that there's nine appendices to the document. They're non-mandatory, but it talks about taking readings on things like pipe and, and I-beams and how to measure thickness on edges, if that's of interest. So there's a lot of extra information in there as well for different configurations. Uh, John. Uh, based on the, what Bill talked about in the standards, do both of these instruments, the single reading probe and the scanning probe, uh, meet those standards? So yes, both uh, the standard applies because uh, it's dealing, like Bill said, mainly with frequency and use uh, of the, uh, the instruments for measurement. The biggest difference between the two is that the scanning probe takes a lot more readings over a larger area compared to the single, uh, single reading uh, Typical F probe that the uh, you know that we're more accustomed to, and the the standard doesn't really address the frequent. It doesn't address that in this uh, setting. So right now the standards don't address the scanning probe. They do address the single probe. That's correct. And, and we'll talk a little more about that here I in a moment. Um, but Bill, why would someone want? to use a probe that gives you a continuous readout like that versus the individual readings? I can actually think of a, a couple of reasons off the top of my head. I mean, you, you're going to get a lot more data with a scanning probe. Um, not only can you get a lot more data, but you can get a lot more data a lot faster. Um, you saw in a few seconds, I probably got upwards of 20 to 25 readings with just that single scan, where with a uh, place and remove probe, you know, it may take, you know, several minutes to get that, that, that same amount of data. Uh, per, and, and perhaps um, if I was moving the probe a little bit faster, I could have gotten even more readings. Well, John, let me ask you <coughs> something. Having formerly been a contractor and, look, and being active in the inspection business, do you have any concerns collecting that much more data? It's uh, hard to say the concerns of the data, but more importantly, it's, it's going to be the um, like we mentioned before, is almost apples to oranges. So if I'm taking single point readings versus large read, there's going to be a difference in method of uh, collecting the data. So there may be different averages, and it's it, it won't be comparable. So if the contractor's using a single point and the owner's using um, a, a scanning probe, the there may be differences in the average readings, and that uh, they're, they're not fair to compare to one another. All right, can you just demonstrate very quickly um, taking readings on that plate with, with your gauge, 
Sure. And I may want to have Bill compare it just so that people can see the difference in the time and the number of readings that are actually taken. Sure. So if I were to say the square represents uh, an average area of 100 square feet, of course I would take three readings on this spot, three readings on this spot, three additional readings on another spot. And how many spots are you going to be doing for I'll that 100? I'll be doing five spots for, for each area. So in that amount of time, I took 15 individual readings that represents five spots that would become representative of the 100 square foot area. Okay. Bill, do you mind, uh, you can use your sure. plate, just showing uh, what you might do with a scanning probe on that same, quote, 100 square foot area? Sure. And, and really, there's, there's a couple of options there. I can do what John just did with a scanning probe, but I can do it a little faster because what I'm going to do is rather than picking up the gauge and placing it down, I'm just going to draw the one and a half inch circle that John used. Okay, I'm hearing three beeps, so that's actually three readings. That's three readings. Okay. All right. Or I can take it and do a infinity motion. And get my readings that way. So let me ask you, does that give you any concerns from a contractor standpoint? The last thing Bill just did, this infinity? Well, the last thing I would say, it would give me some concern, just again, it's not measuring the same way. The first demonstration was almost identical to what I did, and, and actually I would tend to agree that using the scanning probe in that fashion would be uh, you know, comparable because mm -hmm. you're, you're measuring the same area, you're, me you're taking the same number of readings, and then that way it would be comparable. But the, <coughs> the infinity um, scanning, I guess, would be, it could, it could be different. Okay. Uh, Bill, in terms of like this scanning and all, is there any, uh, how many, I see the one you did three readings in that size of a quarter or whatever. For the infinity type, how many readings do we generally need to, to uh, characterize an area? There was, uh, there was some research done on that. Back in 2017, uh, and it was actually uh, presented at the SSPC National Conference, uh, but the research was performed by the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory. Um, and they actually was partway done with the research uh, whenever they did uh, release the preliminary results. Uh, and then another uh, paper was presented at the 2018 uh, SSPC National Conference uh, that kind of uh, rounded out the whole project and showed all of the data. And it was quite extensive. Uh, the, the white papers are available from SSPC uh, if you want to read up on them uh, in more detail. But generally what the data showed is that in order to get a statistically significant sample, which the way PA2 is currently written with uh, three gauge readings at each of five spot measurements on 100 square feet, that's not a statistically significant sample, nor was it ever meant to be signi si statistically significant. Uh, it was just what was reasonable on a project to move things along, but still get an idea of the coating thickness in each area. Uh, what the data showed is that you want to get at least 12 readings in a scan to get a, a, a good sampling. But if you get more than 24 readings in a scan, really uh, it's diminishing returns at that point. There, there's little additional data that you're going to gain from that. So the idea is to get between 12 and 24 readings in a scan. 12 and 24. Okay. Could you show us again very quickly just how long it would take to get 12 re in a scan? Just give us a feel for time sure. here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the memory on because that way the uh, number of gauge readings, I can visually see how many I'm getting as I'm doing this. That's 12. It's 26. Okay, interesting. Uh, you had mentioned earlier uh, about the D7091 is uh, like a 2014 and PA2, I think the latest revision was 2017. I'm assuming they didn't address this scanning technology when they were written. Yeah, they, they didn't. In fact, the ASTEM committee, which is D123, uh, part of the D1 uh, committee, uh, has a task group, and they're in the process of uh, looking at updating the standard so that it can be officially balloted to include the use of scanning probes uh, with these continuous readout devices. 
Uh, naturally, we can never predict, you know, if that is actually going to pass ballot and when it's going to pass ballot. Uh, but what we have to remember is, is that the D7091 standard really focuses on gauge use. So uh, the number of readings that you take in a given scan likely won't ever appear in that document. Uh, it, it'll just describe how to use uh, the scanning probe mm -hmm. uh, technology. John, let me come back to you. I'm going to go back a couple steps and just show us how do you verify that these gauges are reading accurately? Well, well, of course, uh, there's always a discussion for calibration versus verification. And calibration, it's important to note that calibration is uh, can only be done by a certified uh, agency. Uh, it's not something you do in the field. So you would get your gauge calibrated. It would come with a cer uh, certificate. That's every year or something like that, it, 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 roughly, whatever? Yes, yes. Most manufacturers recommend doing the recalibration every year. Okay. Um, you, you, you can do it sooner than that if there's any, you know, odd readings or when you're doing your verification, you find the readings are not within the uh, acceptable um, range based on the manufacturer. Mm -hmm. So in the field, you would do your, you'd verify your accuracy by well, first turning on the gauge, but again, examining the probe to make sure that there's nothing on there that could cause any you know, erroneous readings or, you know, um, or anything that could be altering the readings itself. And then what I'm using here are some certified uh, shims. These have a uh, metallic, uh, a non-magnetic coating on top of a, a ferrous steel base. And I would just take some readings inside the circle and verify that it's reading clo it within the uh, specified range. So this one here is, um, this measurement I'm taking is as close as I can get to the anticipated DFT. So I would take those readings, verify that it's within those ranges, uh, the standard I'm measuring is 14.14 mils, so we are okay. right on the dot. So Excellent. It, so once I verify that the gauge is reading accurately, what I'd like to do is uh, take an adjustment. And at, uh, the reason I'm doing that is because the actual surface that you're measuring could slightly alter the readings based on the, the profile, the, the, uh, the, the way the gauge would be reading on the actual substrate. So what I would do is take one of these certified shims, again, visually you know, assess it, make sure that there's no damage on it, that's not uh, indented, there's no creases, anything that could alter the reading. And then I would take my readings on the bare substrate. So after surface preparation, before coating is applied, I would take several readings on here. And then once I would take uh, at least you know, 10 readings on that, so that's statistically accurate, I would make sure that the average was, it was in uh, what the the certified shim would say here, and if it's not, then I would make adjustments on the gauge in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions on how to adjust. All right, so the first thing I do is I check it on the, the smooth standard to make sure the gauge is working properly. It's really correctly on the different shims and the desired thickness range of use. After that's done, I go to the actual prepared steel to incorporate that profile steel type into the gauge reading, put a certified shim on top of it, and adjust it to that shim thickness. So if that shim is right. five mils and I'm reading 5.2 mils, I would tweak it down to, to five mils. That's correct. And I assume that because of the variability in the profile, I'm not gonna get exactly five mils across that entire shim. It may vary by a tenth or so in either direction. And that's correct. And that's why we use the average. So you take the 10 readings okay. and then adjust for the average of the readings. Got it. Now, Bill, for the scanning probe, do you adjust it the same way, or are there differences? No, there's the fact that it scans makes no difference. Um, you would verify accuracy the same way on coded standards, and then you would move over, and uh, you can use certified shims, as John indicated, but you can also use measured shims uh, to to verify or to uh, adjust the gauge over a, uh, a blast cleaned or prepared uh, prepared surface. But the fact that this is a scanning probe versus a, a place or remove probe makes no difference on uh, verification of accuracy and adjustment. Oh, okay. All right. Let's go to a, a real world type example. Now, let's assume, uh, John, you're the contractor got the coating thickness or the coating is being applied you want to measure the thickness you've got the traditional you know put down pick up probe and bill you're the owner's rep you're coming in with a scanning probe mm -hmm. john um would you expect differences in the measurements i, I would again because there's a, a larger data set it's a larger area um 
even though they may be, there may be similarities, if there's, uh, there could be a lot of differences just based on where you're taking the reading versus you know, the, the larger area of the scanning probe. All right, so, um, well, Bill, let me ask you, what do you think? Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I mean, if you are scanning a much larger area, uh, and, and I, I will address that a little bit later, what uh, SSPC PA2 committee is proposing to, you know, what we mean by a larger spot and, and, and how, to, how to scan that spot, you're, you're going to come across pockets of coating thickness that may be out of tolerance that you would otherwise not have discovered because you're checking it at a much lower frequency with uh, the five spots uh, in 100 square feet. So, John, you're taking these five spots, large 100 square foot area. Bill, if I use the scanning probe, I think you demonstrated showing if you did a little circle and it was only three readings. Mm -hmm. If we used that technique, though, to do the five spots, would you expect similarities in that case? I would. And again, I'm not concerned about getting exactly three readings with my scanning probe because PA2 says to get at least three gauge readings per mm -hmm. spot measurement. So if I end up taking five or six, that's okay because I've taken a minimum of three, where John with the place and remove probe is probably just going to take three and then if there's a, an unusually high or low, he'll discard it and replace it. So in other words, if we're taking the readings in the uh, one and a half inch diameter circle, whether it's the scanning probe or John, your probe, you guys feel that the re results should be similar. I, the, I would agree, yes. The I, fear is if we take a scanning probe and just go across that whole 100 square foot surface and take a whole bunch of readings, there we may find differences that can really pick up a lot of different highs and lows potentially. Yes. yes. Okay, so that John would be the agree. difference. Um, so John, in which of these two gauges then would you use to determine specification compliance today? Uh, today, I think uh, you could use either just because the SSPC PA2 Section 8 deter it tells you how the, the frequency of the measurement and, and the uh, method to use. As long as you're using both in that method, I would say that either I mean, either meets the standard. In the one and a half? In the one and a half. half. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, Bill, you mentioned PA2. You guys might be doing something with that? Yes. Um, the the concern was is that if you're going to use a scanning probe and the idea is to get more data you can't have two different measuring frequencies in a single document so the direction the committee is going is to create an appendix it would become appendix 10 the the next available appendix um, and it would be a little bit on how to use uh, the the scanning probe with the continuous readout device it would talk a little bit on um, you know, the, the ideal number of readings to take. And then what we would be looking at, uh, and again, this is just proposed at this point, it's currently in ballot, is this would represent our 100 square foot area. And we would have five uh, segments over uh, that 100 square foot area. Each segment would be approximately 100 square inches or a 10 inch by 10 inch uh, segment and we would do an infinity symbol scan in each one of the segments and collect anywhere from 12 to 24 readings in that scan. So we would be taking a lot more readings in a lot larger spot or segment, if you will, but within the same 100 square foot area. Okay, is it, Bill, if you could hold that back up again, yes. is there a possibility that the standard might evolve to the point where someone could go from that top left block, drag straight across to the right, down diagonal and make a Z pattern on the entire 100 square foot, or are you still looking at five individual locations? It would be five individual locations. So again, uh, this, uh, the, the location average would be uh, compared to the restriction level that the specifier has selected. If they didn't specify a restriction level, it would become level three. So any one of these segments, the average of the 12 to 24 readings has to be within 80% of the minimum thickness and 120% of the maximum specified thickness. But when we average all five segments together, it has to fall within specification. So essentially what we're doing here is we're taking more individual gauge readings over a larger area. Okay, John, um, let's assume that this Appendix 10 existed and someone said measure the thickness per PA2. 
could someone walk right out and use the scanning probe? Not unless Appendix 10 was actually specified. Okay. Because otherwise the appendices are non-mandatory, so if the specification would call for Appendix 10, then it would be invoked and then you would be able to use the scanning probe. So if it's not invoked and someone says PA2, they just have to do those individual spots? As the standard is today, yes. Okay. But let me clarify that. If I had a scanning probe, as long as my scan was a one and a half inch diameter circle, I can use that technology today. You could do it right now? Yes. All right. Bill, I'm going to ask you to hold that diagram up one more time. I've yes. got another question. Right now, if that middle section today, let's assume that was only one and a half square inches, was too low, how do I define the non-conforming area today? Well, what we would do is there's a, actually a diagram in SSPCPA2 that shows what to do when you have a non-conforming spot measurement or a non-conforming area measurement, and you would use that same approach. It's just that you would come out and you would make an additional scan rather than a additional spot measurements. But, but right now, the, the standard says go out five feet. Yes. Take a uh, yes. three. Yes. Well, five, three, take three. Mm -hmm. With the scanning probe, you might be able to just drag across that whole distance, or is that not decided yet? Uh, that's not decided, but that might be an interesting approach because rather than assuming that five feet is the right distance and to take additional measurements, if you just start scanning outward, you're going to be able to identify a lot faster uh, the magnitude of your nonconforming area. Okay. John, uh, if that were the case, I'm measuring inside a tank and I find a non-conforming area. As we currently do it, we're just taking an infinitesimally small surface to go around and to measure out how far that non-conforming area is. With a scanning probe, though, I'm literally doing a scale starting as far as I can reach. Does that cause concern that you might get, uh, might continually find a spot here or there and have to keep going, keep going, keep going? Well, that would be my concern because in this, in the, the process you're using now, you're taking a, an area, or uh, in the area consists of five spots. Those spots, it's, it's averages of readings, the averages of the spots to create the area. So as you're scanning, it's so, I don't want to say um, specific, but you know, it, it's, it's, it may be, it, we, we need those averages to actually be representative of the area. It's not such a precise science. Yeah. So I, I would be afraid that you would never, maybe never find that end. No. How do we avoid all this? I mean, we're throwing confusion here and things that don't yes. exist yet. Yeah. But how do we uh, how do we reconcile all this? Well, well, I, I think it comes down to two main things. I think it comes down to education, and then communication. And I want to I want to expand a little bit on both of those because standalone they don't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, if you're doing quality control or quality assurance level inspection, you need to be well trained in the standards. Um, that are invoked by the contract documents, otherwise you risk either under inspection or over inspection. Uh, I, I get some arguments on this, but SSPCPA2 is not a complicated document if you sit down and, and, and work through it. Yes, it has nine or perhaps a tenth now appendix, but those aren't invoked unless by specification they're not mandatory. So it's not too bad of a document that way, but you may believe that the, the number of spot measurements and area measurements are minimums if you don't understand the standard. Uh, so it's important to, to, to make sure you under, truly understand those uh, either by formal training or, or studying the standard itself before you go out onto the job. And then second is the communication. Uh, if you're going to specify SSPCPA2 in your contract document, you have to know up front what you're asking for. If you are going to, if you want an increased number of values, whether it's uh, gauge readings, spot measurements, or area measurements on a job, you can take exception to PA2's frequency and say, I want uh, 10 spot measurements per area rather than the five that, that, that PA2 specifies. Uh, but you have to ask for that up front so that the, the contractors bidding the work uh, bid it appropriately. Um, and again, we, we don't have to focus on the technology. We can use either gauge as long as we are conforming to the frequency that's in the, the SSPC standard. Great. Wow. A lot of information. Uh, do, do you have any final comments? 
Uh, I mean, the only comment, I guess, is you see there's different technology, but uh, you, you need to understand the substrate that you're, uh, you're measuring. You need to make sure you, uh, the, you have the right probe for the thickness of the coatings that you're measuring, and then also uh, uh, fully understanding the spec requirements, and that's you know, making sure that there's the right acceptance criteria in the, in the specific method to be used so that when you are collecting this data in the field, it is, uh, it's comparable data between contractor and owner and that you're doing it in a you know, particular method to a, an applicable standard so that the results are meaningful and it's, you, know, you, you have a good representative or a good representation of the area in a whole. You're, you can't measure everything all over the place, so you want to have a fair representation. Getting back to Bill's point, where you have a, uh, you understand the coding thickness, but you don't spend a lot of time collecting that data as well. Yeah, and the the, the fear with the scanning probes was big data. Mm -hmm. We're going to end up with just loads and loads and loads of measurements. Now what are we going to do with all this information? We've taken a thousand measurements in a very short period of time, and uh, number 567 looks like it's uh, out of specification, so how do we find that location? And, and the fear is we have to find it and try to fix it. Mm -hmm. So what the, the, the uh, Dry Film Thickness Committee is trying to do is say, yes, we can use scanning probes, but we don't need to get a thousand readings. 12 to 24 in a segment and five segments over 100 square feet, we're going to get a little bit better sampling of the area, but still it's we're limiting the amount of data we're getting. Excellent. All right. Thank you. Uh, in summary, uh, we're verifying the accuracy of the gauges during use. We're not calibrating. Calibration is done in a laboratory or a, a certified uh, representative of the manufacturer. But in the field, you're verifying the accuracy by first using the smooth standards to make sure the gauge reads properly. Then you're incorporating the effect of the, sur of the steel, the surface profile into it by putting a measured shim or uh, a calibrated shim on that surface to adjust the gauge to read exactly that thickness on the profile. Uh, we discussed one gauge, the Pause Detector 6000, but there are other manufacturers who have similar gauges with scanning probes, both from Alcometer and uh, Fisher Technology. ASTM uh, addresses the use of the gauges, uh, how to adjust them and make sure they're reading properly. PA2, SSPC PA2, addresses the number of readings to take and, and uh, number of uh, soon. Uh, options for using the scanning probe without overkilling it and measuring every square inch of the surface, but still staying within that five spots per 100 square feet, although in this case, if the uh, appendix passes, the spots will be a much larger area than just one and a half square inches. Uh, the scanning probe, the number of readings to take will probably be between 12 and 24 per scan. And when you're using the scanning probe, you really need to verify that that cap or the protective cover isn't worn uh, when you're doing your adjustments to make sure if that needs to be replaced so your probe isn't being damaged. When both are being used on a job, you can expect differences in the readings unless you limit the scanning probe to, for example, uh, three or five or, or readings per one and a half square inches, the same as the uh, place down a remove probe. So if you limit the area, the size of the area you are measuring, still do those five of those areas per hundred square feet, you should get very similar results. It shouldn't be a difference. Where you might find differences though is if you did a Z pattern across the entire surface. I think that's it. Thank you for logging on and watching KTA podcasts. Please log on in the future to see other podcasts or other technical articles related to cleaning and painting.